one three one five. My dog tag was four twelve forty eight zero zero. At the time the war broke out, I was uh, attending college in uh, Santa Barbara State College in Santa Barbara, California. I had grown up uh, during the Depression, all through that era, and so. Uh, where, where were you born? 19 October 9, 1921. Okay. And where? Santa Barbara, California. Okay. I grew up as a uh, very, very staunch Republican. And I'll put that in the record too, because <laughs> my mother, my mother, came from Germany, and my dad was a uh, ran a plumbing shop. He Your had, mom was old country German. Yep, she uh, she emigrated from Germany All with right. a huge family, about sixteen. All right. And um, my dad was had <coughs> had gone through uh, grade school, and had gone to work as a plumber, and had worked himself up into uh, superintendent of the largest plumbing shop in Southern California at that time. He was an excellent, uh, excellent man, very quiet, and a good estimator. And uh, the, every everybody thought the world of my dad. I went to school at Santa Barbara High School. Uh, met my good wife Marge at that time in a football game. I was uh, student buddy president of Santa Barbara High School, and then I went on to uh, Santa Barbara State College. And um, at the time the war broke out, I was finance chairman of the student buddy. So, when, when so you were growing up during the Depression, was it pretty comfortable back in those days for your family, or was it? Our family, uh, we grew up. Uh, my dad had, a, in those days, was considered a pretty good job. Right. He, uh, he never we, lost his job during those years. Oh no, 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 no. He ran, he ran a crew of maybe uh, forty plumbers or so, and uh, it wasn't wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, we didn't suffer. Right. And uh, we lived down by the East Beach in Santa Barbara, and uh, my relationship uh, and friends at that time were across. There's a railroad track, and see, we were down here isolated, only a couple of houses near the beach, where the Marmani Hotel is today. And so, uh, I had to uh, go to the Franklin Grammar School, which was oh, a mile and a half away, or something like that. And uh, in route, you went through. I had Japanese friends. I had I had uh, uh, Norman Toxagawa and Joe Nakayama, and. Um, uh, they were uh, basically uh, in, in the gardening business at that time, and David Rios, his father, was worked in the big estates in Montecito. A lot of the people in Santa Barbara that era uh, serviced the uh, the big estates in uh, in Santa Barbara, <coughs> and um, I had friends, um, Hank Barons. Uh, Tommy Kruger. They came from all. There, it was a mix. Uh, there wasn't, I think, in uh, when I went to junior high school, we only had one black in, in the school, George Moore. And uh, in high school, we only had one, one or two. Latney Gallette was a wonderful uh, football player. So anyway, I had an exposure to all types of ethnicity. It was, uh, I wasn't uh, restricted to just one. one. Now, with a, with a German mom, so my, my dad also grew up in a German family, and he tells stories about how they thought they were actually very pro-German. Before the war, as they thought that uh, things were, uh, well, and they thought it was good. How did, how, how was that experience in your family? I'll get to that. <clears throat> My mother was, uh, she ran the family, no question about it. If I said I wanted to run away, she'd say fine and throw all the clothes out the back door and say, here, you may need these. So then I'd call back in again. If, uh, if, uh, a Democrat came into the house, and my mom found out she was a, he was a Democrat. She said, "You may be excused," and she would just literally take him out the door. She didn't had no use for him. She's a very strong-willed, uh, willed person. And so, uh, on December uh, on December eight, the day after Pearl Harbor, she called in my older brother Arnold, who was ten years older than I am. I was. And she said, sons, uh, this country has been good for me, and it's been wonderful for your dad. And she said, uh, 
the time has come. You've got 30 days to make up your mind which branch of the service you want to go into. I, she says, I don't care what, where you go or what you do, but be, be it known that in 30 days, if you're not signed up, you can pack your clothes and leave. And she meant it. So, uh, so she had no, uh, no problems with the idea of, uh, of uh, America fighting Germany? Well, this was Japan. December 7th. Well, December 8th. Uh, I think uh, December Germany de declared war in the United States. December. Well, uh, this was the day after after Pearl Harbor, right. and we were all concerned with uh, uh, the Japanese, not right. the Germans. Right. No, she had no misgivings about that whatsoever. So um, I went up, went back to school, and uh, on, on December uh, that that very day, uh, uh, what was December 7 was. Uh, December 8th, the next day of school anyway, and um, we had a $10 student buddy fee, and anybody that enlisted we would refund them. And uh, I, I could still still see the line of, of guys, they were, they were a mile, it seemed like a mile long, the just next all day. the very next day, I said, where are you going? We're going to war. We don't know where we're going. We want our student buddy fee. We want to go. Can you imagine that? And it was a frenzy. It was a little frenzy. These these guys would come up, and we give them their. Uh, I had a doctor, uh, uh, a physiology doctor, who was a uh, faculty advisor, and we sat there and we doled out the student buddies, and we were we were just about broke by the time that day went by, and it was amazing. People, guys, just came up there and they said, "We're gone. We're gone. We're gone." Well, uh, some of us with saner heads. Uh, thought a bit. I had a real good friend who was flying uh, in civil air aviation at that time and uh, a Navy recruiter came, uh, came on board uh, the school and said uh, we have a program called V5 and V5 will allow you to complete your semester and at which time you, can, you come into the Naval Air Corps. And he said, we'll, uh, we'll form a squadron, we'll have it called the Gaucho Squadron. And you guys can go to war and fly together and fight the war again. Oh, geez, that sounded great. So a bunch of us signed up for the V-5 program. We signed up to be in the Gaucho Squadron. Well, at the end of the, uh, the semester, uh, I had to go down and uh, take a physical uh, at Long Beach to get into the Navy. and. Uh, went down there and I failed. So the chief said, well, you go home and you work out in the, in the pool every day and come back next week. And I just went home and, I, and he said, you got, what you got, what you got to do is just exhaust yourself. Get your anxieties down. So I went back down the next day, uh, a week from then, and sure enough, I got in. Well, the had, you ever, had you ever flown before? No, 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 I knew nothing about it. During that, during that interim time between uh, uh, the, end, the end of the, oh, it was, it was about almost four months when I went into flight, I went into flight training on uh, um, 723-42, that was July 23. Uh, pre-flight pre-flight training. Well, the uh, the Gaucho Squadron ended as long it lasted uh, till we all got in line, and then when they said uh, file uh, file alphabetically, that was the end of the squadron. <laughs> <laughs> we saw we never saw the squadron again. And they clipped your hair, and we went off to pre-flight school for three three months mm -hmm. over here at St. Mary's, in which they put you in physical conditioning, and then of course then I went all through the training training programs. Uh, Livermore and um, uh, Corpus Christi and Jacksonville, Florida, and, and then fleet qualifying. And then we were assigned to the squadron in Alameda. So you, you, obviously you started with uh, trainers and more advanced airplanes and more. Advanced oh yeah! Oh yeah! 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 Oh yeah! 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 yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, if I can lead you on a little bit, sure. um, you probably lost friends right in that process, didn't you? Not too much in uh, in basic or or uh, advanced training. Uh, where we started losing people was in the, when we got into the squadron, and we'd uh, 
had, uh, I know one night we were on a, we'd go out and bomb the Farallons at night, drop flares, it was an exercise, and um, a fellow named uh, Delbert Goodspeed, uh, he got uh, vertigo, you know, you're flying at night and you're looking at, a, at the running lights on the airplane and you're flying in close formation, well, sometimes you get a fixation and the fixation might not be that running light, it might be a star. And so poor old Delbert over Watsonville just went in and everybody called him, hey, come on, good speed, good speed, good speed, and he crashed. That was the end of him. And we had another fellow who we were doing, when we were doing uh, fleet training uh, out of Alameda, uh, it was kind of a foggy day, and uh, this fellow ran into the cables of the Golden Gate Bridge. He got a little, we'd go up, make the circle, come back. And he clipped the cable, and, and that was the end of him. And then we had a couple that went in on dive bombing runs. They just uh, didn't pull out. Mm -hmm. Fact is, we lost our skipper, uh, Rocky Dixon, who joined us in, in Watsonville. Uh, we were on an exercise with the Army off of San, down in San Luis Obispo. And um, the Army uh, gave us the wrong elevations. It was uh, a dive bombing run in the mountains off of San Luis Obispo. And Rocky was a type of person that uh, he was going to get, the, he was a fleet, fleet experienced uh, commander. And he was going to get the hit. And he, he always did, but this time he pulled out too low, and that was the end of uh, uh, Rocky Dixon, uh, Dickinson. So we actually went went aboard ship. Uh, we got on the uh, Lexington. Now, how did you, how did you end up in dive bombers versus fighters versus reconnaissance? Oh, you had your choice. You had your choice. You could go uh, you could go fighter squadron, or you could go uh, or you could go the Marines, or you could go. I went in the Navy because uh, I said. And a lot of us said, well, uh, if everything goes right, at least we've got a bunk to sleep in. We don't have to sleep in the mud. Right. If we get back to ship and the ship is there, uh, you got the a... <laughs> you, you got a... Well, there's a couple of times it wasn't there. Yeah. Uh, you got a place to uh, to bunk down in. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go into the Army, you're, you know, you come back and uh, you're still sleeping uh, in dirt and mud and so forth and so on. So if you're going to fight the war, do it in a deluxe fashion. Uh, or as deluxe as you could get it. So uh, whether it went into fighters or, 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 or bombers, uh, I don't know. We just... Now you must have had guys watch out, too, that didn't make the cut. Oh, sure. So yeah. was there pressure that if, if you didn't make the cut, you would go into the infantry or something? Or Well, uh, I don't know. And uh, There weren't too many washouts. All right. they, 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 they made sure you got through. They, right. uh, they, they, uh, they needed pilots and... Uh, it wasn't, uh, they weren't that selective. They weren't very, very selective. They, uh, they, right. they did everything they could to get you through. Right. And, uh, and get you to be a, a reasonably good pilot. So your training from, say, July of 42, when you first went to your training, how many months of training did you have before you actually joined the fleet? <coughs> Almost a year. Almost a year. That's Almost a year, yeah. Pretty intense then. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, uh, we never stayed longer than three months in any place, and uh, we got to the islands, and uh, we were at uh, Pearl Harbor, or, or no, initially they shipped us right to Hilo, and that was, uh, uh, you know, Hilo got a lot of bad weather, and we did a lot of uh, night flying down there, and a lot of radar training. They'd go up in these uh, big storms, and uh, uh, you couldn't see anything. That's when you had to rely on your radio men. That's why Jim Crow, he'd have the, the radar then was kind of primitive, but it could tell you the distance from shore, and we'd circumnavigate the island, the big island Hawaii, at night, and uh, you couldn't see anything, and you had to rely on on the decision of your uh, radar man, so how far offshore you were, and then of course when you came in to land. Uh, you'd come in on a radio beam, and uh, but but when you were at sea in combat, did you have that luxury? Did you could, did you have radio beams that would bring you back? And well, oh, oh yeah, we had called ZB, and uh, this is where uh, I'll tell you, I got ahead of my story a little bit. In the Battle of the uh, of Legayan Gulf, uh, we were uh, on the second strike. 
and um, I was flying on Ben and we came in he was a great uh, great tactician he could position you know the, the classic out of the sun and uh, when we dove on the Jap fleet uh, we had a proc uh, the, the uh, US Navy had a proximity fuse and the proximity fuse was one that went up the, the shell and the aircraft shell would go up when it got within a certain distance of an airplane it would blow up the Japanese did not have this so in lieu of that they used colors and each anti-aircraft gun had a different color so when you came over the fleet the anti-aircraft fire was and it was it, it was like someone had been disemboweled there were purple green pink red everything just it was just a, a huge color panorama that you right. you dove through well we dove through I was uh, I dove right behind Ben and um, came out of that drive and uh, I got a hit on the Mushashi which at that time was a sister ship of the Yamato the biggest battleship in the world and uh, this is part of Lady Gulf then? The yeah Leyte Gulf yeah the battle, the battle of Surigao Straits and uh, so uh, I dropped my bomb you couldn't miss it it was like diving on a city block you know it looked that big um, we lost a couple in the dry in the dive but getting back to the story uh, we rendezvoused came back to ship and then the next day we were went out on another strike and then led us over uh, it was south of Surigao Straits and there was a, another uh, fleet of Japanese warships coming through uh, the Straits and we dove but it was a cloudy day and when we had to dive through clouds and when we came out of the dive there was hardly any of us we, we missed the ship we were diving on completely cloud cover had uh, had come in um, so I pulled up and um, I had lost uh, uh, lost the rest of the planes. I pulled pulled back up into the clouds, and uh, I turned to my to turn to Jim and I called him on uh, on the intercom. I said, "Crow, uh, are you game? You want to make a uh, a low level attack on that cruiser?" He said, "Let's go, sir." So uh, we were only about. Mm, seven or eight thousand feet I guess something like that and uh, with no other airplanes around you no no I was a single I was a sing single airplane so I came in and when you're coming in like that you you, you jinx you keep going like this and they're shooting because they see you coming and oh sure oh sure oh sure sure they see you coming and I got in and the ship was in a in a big arc it was turning if you can picture this there are all kinds of inter inter aircraft guns that are shooting and uh, I dropped the bomb and the bomb just missed the fantail. It landed right near, but didn't hit the ship, which was a disappointment. So, after you, you get through the dive, you you make uh, you take evasive action. You know, you go up and down and jinx like this so they can't get a bead on you. But when it came out, uh, I got the chart board out and try to figure out where in the where in the devil I was and um, figured it out that I had missed the rendezvous point where the rest of the squadron had, had gone. I'd long since missed that. So we started out in the general direction of the, uh, of the fleet. And I flew along and uh, pretty soon a torpedo plane comes up and joins us. He's from another carrier. But he's one of yours. Yeah, not one of ours, not another carrier. And we go along a little ways further and pretty soon uh, another SB2C comes up, another dive bomber from another carrier. And so the three of us are going along like this, and we come upon a, a Jap float plane. And this Jap was just sailing along, and you know, float plane, seaplane. So we just come up behind him, and we uh, SB2C had 20 millimeter cannons on it. They were good. Uh, let them have it. 
and uh, we saw him parachute. So then we, you know, you come along, boom, boom, and then you just take off and you start going in the general direction. And so um, we went along. I, I don't know how long because the gas was, you, uh, gas was always a problem. You 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 cut your RPMs way down, so you're playing. Your prop is just barely ticking, and your manifold pressure is low. Want to make sure you have as much gas as possible. And so, so you can stretch stretch your gas. And um, we got out over the Pacific Ocean, and uh, we were headed in the general direction. And suddenly, Jim Crow, my gunner, comes on the radio. comes on. He says, "Sir, I I have the ZB, the ship." I said, you sure you got it, Jim? He says, yes, sir. And that's the beacon, radio beacon. That's the radio beacon sent out by the carrier. And I, he says, it's about 30 degrees off the starboard, sir. I said, you sure? You got it, huh? He says, I got it. So you give the waggle to the other two planes, and which was the kiss off. And we just, they went this way and we went that way. And <clears throat> it seemed like an eternity. He chugging along, chugging along, and 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 Jim's sitting back there with his radio on, you know, and he's he's keep keeps giving me the 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 direction. And sure enough, by golly, we came up to the Intrepid. You could see it on the horizon, and I got the signal from the carrier: uh, "Don't make a pass. Come straight aboard." You know, normally, gas. yeah, normally you when when you you land on a carrier, you come alongside the bridge like this, and then you peel off, you you make make the circle, and come around, and the landing signal officer would pick you up, and and bring you aboard. Well, this time they uh, they they flashed the uh, the beacon, the lights, you know, did da did da 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 da. I said, come straight aboard. So came up the groove, landed. Get a couple of chugs, and that was it. The engine stopped right then and there. Wow! And so, <laughs> Ad Admiral Admiral Bogan was on board. He says, "Send that pilot up to the bridge immediately." So I went up, and he said, uh, "Where's the rest of the squadron?" So I told him the story. I said, "I just got lost. I, I got separated when I made the second dive, and I don't know where they are, sir." He says, "Well, you're the first one back, son." And um, eventually, the, the rest of the, the guys, including Ben, uh, they came in, and quite a few, quite a few of them had to uh, ditch their planes, ran out of uh, ran out of fuel. And they would send a destroyer out, pick up guys like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, um, and that usually wor worked out okay. I mean, got, those guys were got, got picked up. Yeah. Though we had a, we had. Uh, that's one reason why I, uh, I recommended uh, Jim Kroll for the uh, air crew role of honor because uh, he saved our neck that night, that day. I mean, we may we may have ended up on another carrier or someplace else, but we got back our, on our own ship. And saved the airplane too, for that matter. Yeah, right. But another incident uh, when we were uh, we were uh, bombing. Uh, the northern Philippines, it was called Formosa then, and uh, 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 Shinchiku, the northernmost harbor, I may have that, I think it was Shinchiku, been a long time, but we went in uh, to dive bomb uh, the power station and uh, the naval facilities there. And again, it was a very low cast. Uh, it was a bum day as far as dive bombing. There was a lot of cloud cover and a lot of rain. And um, it was in that dive. That's when old Dan Baker. We had a crossover. This guy was in the uh, uh, flying wing. Uh, crossed over, you know, and it w to get into position, you ha you may be over here, so you have to put a section over here, and then you put them in the echelon, one, two, three, four, five, six, like this, to make your dive. So but you have to, there's signals, you know, and you just move, you move your plane. So this one, you're approaching, then? You, you, you come, you got, you got three planes, three planes here, 
And three planes here, they could be over here, or over here, or they could be up here, depending upon how the division leader wanted you. Uh, in this instance, they were down here. And so they crossed over to get into uh, echelon preparatory for the dive. And Dan cut off half of my stabilizer. And he's a, he's a good friend of ours. He's still alive. He lives in Walnut Creek. Uh, uh, he's an attorney. But anyway, uh, Dan cut off part of my tail. And, uh, but we went into the dive and uh, uh, came out. And a lot of the fellows, uh, we found out that it had a, they had a brutal crossfire, anti-aircraft fire. The Japanese had a, uh, it, was a, it was a long harbor. And they had crossfire like this. And they really uh, knocked down a lot of our planes that day. But we, we came back and uh, our fighter cover had disappeared. We had one, one plane for fighter cover and it was a guy named Don Watts who later became a fertilizer, uh, liquid fertilizer uh, salesman and owner uh, down here in San Jose and I used to fly with him in the reserve after the war. And Don was our only only air cover. So he's in and a Hellcat or something? Yeah, he's in a Hellcat. He was circling above there. And so we, we came back and then we ran into uh, this horrendous storm. Um, the torpedo squadron, the tor torpedo uh, squadron, uh, the division there, they had six planes. They were detached. They elected to land their planes in an open water. There, there was an open spot in this storm, and they put six planes in the water. And Ben says, the hell with that, we're going to find the ship. So we plowed right through that, all that weather, and uh, sure enough, he brought us home, and we were, we were uh, one of the few that got back that day. A lot of planes went in the water on that one. And, and that was which encounter? What was that called? Shinsi, off of Shinsiko, it's a battle off of northern uh, Formosa. Let me see if I can... Actually, we're, I guess we're going to skip Fine. around, but that's great because I'm, I'm loving the stories. But when, if you had to guess, when was the first time you were actually... Well, I want to make a point here. Okay. The point is that Admiral Halsey was a, a pilot's pilot. Mm -hmm. And he kept, he kept the fleet right there and and said, we're going to pick those pilots, those pilots up because there were supposed to be Japanese aircraft and Japanese submarines and everything else in the area. And he said, uh, the hell with that, we're going to stay there and we're, we're, we're going to go get our pilots. And he did. Mm -hmm. So and Put the ships at risk. And oh yeah, bulls hall, bull halls he wouldn't run. You know, some guys would turn around and take the whole fleet out of danger, but mm -hmm. uh, he stayed there overnight and the next day and, and picked up his pilots. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there were a lot of them floating around. I had two friends that landed in the water. Uh, okay. Well, I just kind of want to get an overview. So uh, maybe we can talk about it. just kind of skip real quickly, and then then we can flesh it out a little bit. But like your, your first encounter with combat would have been when? Uh, the battle of uh, when we bombed uh, the Marines landed at uh, Peleliu, mm -hmm. and, and, and it was called Babelthop. And that's about when. Uh, September. September forty-four. Yeah. Uh, let me see. I got a couple of logbooks here. Some of them are. So basically, if you just follow the history of the Intrepid, you were with them from. Oh yeah, we were with them. We were with them all the way uh, until they got uh, knocked out of uh, commission. And and the Intrepid, according to this history had to go back to stateside a couple times because it got... Well, we hit. got hit. We got hit on two occasions. One occasion, a kamikaze hit the gun tub. I was aboard ship that day. Wasn't flying. And uh, we had a bunch of uh, mess cooks who served. There they were gunners too. And uh, uh, this chap landed right in that gun tub and wiped out and all ten of those fellows wow. just wiped them out and I I I was there I saw the whole thing and uh, uh, their skins were white they put them in the meat baskets you know and, uh, 
take them down. But th that day the, sh the ship got hit, but it wasn't knocked out of commission. Was that Okinawa or? Oh, no, no, no. This is uh, before, that? before then. It was before the Leyte Gulf. So uh, they were doing the kamikazes even before Leyte Gulf? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, you imagine that it's just a sign of desperation on the part of the Japanese. Well, they, it's, it's like you got the terrorists today yeah. doing the same sort of thing. They come in and, uh, no, well, there's a whole history be behind the kamikazes. Um, they trained them, these young pilots. Uh, let's see. So these airplanes you were flying could be dive bombers, but they could also be low-level bombers, too. Well, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Sk skip bombing and uh, low-level bombing and... Uh, uh, one of the missions we had was to anti-submarine patrol. You'd go out on a on a on a vector, maybe 200 miles this way, and look for submarines and and, and everything like that. But we we uh, yeah we on Peleliu that was uh, September 17 supported the Marines and, and the bombing of, of Peleliu. So you guys were doing close support. Yeah, we'd go in there, and when they tell us to, there was a, a gun emplacement there that had to be uh, knocked out. We we try to knock it out. Um, and was it such that you could actually, when you got close enough to it, you could actually see the gun emplacement? And oh no, no, no. You're 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 at, you're at two thousand fifteen hundred feet. They'd give you a fix on it. And you could see it, and uh, then you'd try to hit that. Now, uh, Shinchiku. That's what you asked. Uh, that was on uh, October 14. Uh, yeah, I hit a transformer. We we bombed the factory in Shinjuku and uh, hit a hit a big transformer there. So how many combat missions did you fly? Do you think, or did you even keep track? Oh Jesus! Oh the whole. I didn't honestly didn't I don't know. <laughs> I, that's, that's, I, I can't give you. Maybe I forgot. I should should know, but they didn't count missions. It, it was just time. Right. And uh, the, uh, we hit the uh, the Jap fleet on October twenty four. And that's late. Uh, off of uh, no, that was off of Pane, P A N A. That was a glide. That's a glide bombing run I told you about where uh, we got we went out and missed the first and had to go back on it. Um, what was the biggest threat to you from the Japanese? Was it any aircraft carrier? Uh, any aircraft fire? Or did you ever did you ever encounter any Japanese airplanes? Not really. Well, we All were Clark Field we did. We had, uh, yeah, we, we bombed Clark Field. Uh, this is before uh, MacArthur had come. And um, uh, even though we had fighter cover, uh, some of our guys, there was a couple of, a couple of one, one lieutenant, I think it was Eisengreen, uh, thought he was a fighter pilot and he took out after a Japanese uh, fighter and, and the fighter got the best of him. Hmm. So uh, when, when they came, uh, and he had a, a, an attack, uh, a, a fighter attack, you'd bunch up. And that was the purpose. He had a radio man and a gunner. And our gunners had uh, 30 millimeter machine guns. Mm -hmm. So you'd, they, you, they had that fi firepower to cover your tail. And was that a little turret or something? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Right. It was a pretty good machine gun. And then we had 20 millimeter cannons in front. So that's the best protection that a bomber could do. And then get low to the ground. Right. Uh, or low to the water. So you're uh so you, you not only did you have your your hits as a dive bomber, but you actually shot down an airplane yourself, then didn't you? No, I didn't shoot down any airplane. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, no, the, no, the, no, the, no, no. Other guys in the uh, no, no. The uh, plane? Well, that, well, what we shot down. Uh, oh, that one, yeah. We we shot that one, down, but that was oh, that was that was <laughs> sitting duck. That wasn't anything. Uh, just come up behind him and give him a couple of blasts. That's all. That was too easy. Um, now we had uh, we had uh, on that night in October 
30th. Uh, I have a note here where Eisengreen, he was the uh, uh, lieutenant and, and his, and his uh, uh, radio man parachuted over Shinshiku, never heard of him. Boyle, McNeil, VT, Fletcher, and Skelly all got killed. Uh, uh, Meacham, uh, the VF, and Swenson, his gunner, they ran out of gas in the groove and got it. We had another case where a guy Saving took... in the groove, you mean approaching the air? Yeah, yeah, I ran out of gas and... Uh, uh, what would happen then? They'd plow in the back of the ship or something? Or, well, they have destroyers back there to pick them up, but uh, sometimes if you got bad weather, they miss. Um, and note here were Roquefort of the VT and Mollenhauer of the VF and Namaski of VB, all shot down by Jap fighters. Uh, upon, this is on the uh, 29th of October, upon return ship in storm and night had fallen. Uh, there, let's see. A couple of guys went down off the Philippine Islands in rubber boats. Thompson and Hedrick, VF missing after night tactics. Baker and Clancy uh, made water landings. This is our, my friend over, and uh, well, both of these guys were very good friends. In fact, is Bob Clancy. We just buried him the other day, or a couple of months ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Then I, uh, a plane from the Hancock landed in our catwalk and burned both the gunner and the pilot, but the pilot was okay. They, they got out. Uh, they had deck crashes on the Cabot, that was a smaller carrier. Two VF collided in midair. We landed aboard after coming through the storm. Same day, Jap bomber crashed into our deck, killing ten gunners. Uh, Bunch and Cunningham. Bunch was uh, uh, one of our uh, pilots. Uh, they got, uh, had to make a, a landing at Palawan and they uh, ended up in a leper colony and uh, he was a hypochondriac, he was my roommate aboard ship and uh, he was a hypo he really was, he really was, he was a great tennis player but uh, the guy would stand up in front of the mirror and he'd, he had one hair on his chest and he'd comb that you know and, <laughs> and bunch, well it was a tragic deal eh? Uh, of all the people that had to get into a leper colony, he was he was a guy that shouldn't have been there because he came back. They rescued him, but submarines rescued him, brought him back. And uh, when when he went down, um, there were three of us in, in our stateroom. We we uh, divvied up his liquor. They had an allotment. This, before we went aboard, I won't go into the story of that, but the skipper had made a deal where each of us were permitted to take aboard uh, some old forester, about three fifths cent, uh, of liquor, and we put them in torpedo cases, uh, death bomb, death charge cases, camouflaged them, and he took them down on the bills, and he let each of, each of, us, each of us have a bottle of booze in, in our uh, stateroom. And uh, so a bunch still, still had some booze there. So we do it up, and uh, on, when we came back to the States after the ship got hit, this is in Christmas of 44, uh, we received word halfway between uh, Pearl Harbor and Alameda that Bunch had been rescued by submarine, they were flying him home, and he'd meet the squadron when it docked at Alameda. Well, we went down the gangway, and the first thing that Bunch said to me, he says, where's my booze? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, Pryor and I, my other roommate, Pryor, we, we had to cough up our cherries possession. We, we gave, gave the booze. <laughs> and Chris was a 44, and it was hard to get, you know, real hard to get. Well, he, later on, uh, well, that's another personal story. A bunch uh, went off his rocker and killed his wife, and uh, it was, he lived down in Modesto. Uh, we had... Uh, See, Griffith, the VF, killed on takeoff, engine failure, the ship ran over him. Uh, if you had to guess, I mean, it's only a guess, but um, of, the, of the number of guys that were in your squadron at the beginning, how many guys did you lose by the end? I mean, well, I got, I got the exact record on that. Uh, uh, squadron. picture here of uh, 
and I'll add 20 percent. That was, that was that, that's the figure I got here. 50, 10, 10, or uh, a Sunday puncher. So 80 percent of the guys made it back home. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and unfortunately, it was it was probably oftentimes an all or nothing thing. There, there weren't, weren't guys that got wounded, kind of thing. It was it was a lot, a lot of fatalities, right? Yeah, like yeah. In the army, a lot of guys got wounded. Yeah, no, you you would be in the Air Corps, you wouldn't get wounded. You know, we had some guys that had a little shrapnel on them, but uh, uh, one 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 fellow got got hit by uh, ack ack, and uh, but not, nothing real serious. Uh, you had Cecil Harris, who was a one of the great aces of the war. He was in our fighter squadron. Uh, here, you want a picture? Service picture of yourself? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I got another one here, Marge. Uh, the other thing that was an interesting story. Uh, you know, there's always, uh, on October 1944, you came back from a strike, and after you were in the fleet a while, uh, you become pretty self-confident. So instead of, you're supposed to come in low and slow, and, and the signal officer, Moot, would give you the cut, and you'd, you'd settle it down. That's, that's the... But after, the longer you're in the fleet, the higher you came in and the faster you came in. Cause <laughs> so one day I came in, and uh, it was October in 44, and uh, that one bad thing about the SB2C, it had a propensity for hook bounce. Uh, the Grumman aircraft and the SB, the Grumman aircraft and the SBD, uh, when that hook hit the deck, it hugged, the, it hugged. But the SB2C, if it hit the deck and it, it would get a rhythm, and you could bounce over the wires, you'd have maybe eight wires before you hit the barrier. Well, one day I came in, I was hot, and uh, the hook bounced, and I ended up hitting the gun tur gun tub here. I got a picture of that, and uh, demolished the airplane. And I remember uh, I got out and. Um, I was standing over here by the, uh, alongside where the main part of the ship is, and Lou Bosberg, who was our athletic officer, was an All-American from, from Tulane. Lou prized, uh, uh, was proud of how good a conditioning uh, skies, he kept the skies in, and he said to me, he says, he says, Art, where's the, who's the pilot? I says, I'm the pilot. He says, my God, you got no one saw you get out of the airplane. I said, well, you trained me, Lou. So. The other part was that I turned around and I saw Jim, my gunner. He was, they were putting him in a meat basket. You know, these things that have little mm -hmm. wire frames right. that outline your, your legs and so forth. And uh, I said, oh my God, I've killed Jim. And so they towed him off to, down, down to the sick bay. And I followed, uh, followed him down and uh, uh, got right in to see him. I said, Jim, are you okay? He says, I'm all right, sir. I said, you're not hurt? No, sir. I said, why didn't you unstrap yourself from your seat? Why'd you let him put you in the knee pad? He said, oh, those guys don't do anything. I just thought I'd let them do it. <laughs> he says, he says, he says I, I, re I, I really wasn't worried until he, until they asked me whether I was a Catholic or a Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> so they give him, uh, uh, well, when you come back, they used to give you a shot of brandy. Yeah. And uh, so they even gave Jim, not, not the enlisted guys, only the pilots, they give the, gave uh, Jim, Jim a shot of brandy and he was fine. So that, that was... I've been on the Hornet before across the way, and I guess that's the same class of uh, ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you aviators, did you basically live separate on board from... Most of the other crew, did you? Oh yeah, yeah. We had staterooms. We were yeah. in the, we were in the f forward part of the ship. Yeah, we had staterooms and bunks. There were three of us in uh, in in. Uh, depending on your rank, I went aboard as an ensign, so you got the lowest of the staterooms. And if you were a JG, you got a little bit better, and you know, a lieutenant, you got a little bit better, and a commander, a little bit better. 
But still, you ate separate from those guys. You ever you, 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 you never ate with a crew. No, right. you'd go down and go through, go through the line. Um, were you trained though? Like, if the ship was ever attacked, were you trained also to be a firefighter on board? No, like, no, no, kind of no, no. You just get out of the way. No, 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 no. Uh, if if the ship was under under attack, go to the ready room. Uh, and just stand by. No, they, they they had all the other personnel do that. And like even your gunner, um, as an enlisted man, he he was he's he lived separate from you. On he that was board? in the squadron. He wasn't in the right. uh, ship's personnel. Right. Ship's personnel was one thing. Did you have a crew chief that was assigned just your airplane or something? Oh yeah, yeah, we had crew chiefs. So yeah. so your airplane consisted of yourself, your gunner, and then a. Crew well, chief. I didn't have any crew chief, but the squadron had had okay. had, had maintenance guys and crew chiefs and all that. No, right. we didn't have anyone assigned to a particular airplane. Is that no. right? Okay. No, 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 right. no. Because you could get different airplanes each time. Right. Whatever plane was available when you went out there to fly it. Right. So you weren't structured in. So if I can ask, like, like a mission, like the, like the time that you hit the Masashi, the, the mission would have begun with you guys getting a briefing. Before oh yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. You'd. Uh, He'd get a, a briefing. The uh, skipper would get up in front with uh, blackboard and charts and give you the headings and uh, tell you, you the skipper. You mean the, the squadron commander? Yep. Right. Yep. And uh, and tell who was going to go and what uh, what flights you were going to be on and and the whole works. Well, tell you and what, this is. I'm going to have to change tape, so this is probably a good spot to do. Uh, Let me go um, ten. Clay, yeah. you got a Navy Cross mm -hmm. and a DFC, and and the star here. That is that you uh, have two DFCs. Yeah. The single flying cross, Navy Cross, uh, and the Navy that's second only to the uh, Medal of Honor. Oh, the Navy Cross is the Navy Cross is second to the Medal of Honor. Not too many of those given out. I looked it up on the internet one day. I can't imagine it would have been. What did you, um, this is no time to be shy. What did you get the Navy Cross for? Hitting a putting a bomb in the middle of a battleship. Is that right? Mm-hmm. How many bombs hit that battleship before it went down, you, you guess? Oh, I have no idea. Had to have been a whole bunch, right? Yeah, we could kept attacking and attacking. And then, then eventually the submarines got in there, too. Right. I don't know. We, but, uh... When it, when it went down, apparently they had, actually had footage of it, and it, it just kept running going. The battle went down. It was almost like a submarine. It just disappeared. It was, uh... It was, uh Talk of the times because it was supposed to be unsinkable. You know, it was the biggest one of the biggest battleships around. The DFC. Yeah. You see a, a, a star yeah. like that, means there's actually two DFCs. Okay, the single flying cross and Navy cross. And of course, oh, I'll copy. But that's that's a big deal. I think I got them on the back here, Marge. Yeah, here you can do that. Okay. Those are the others, and then on the back there. Could you explain how you got each of these? Well, in the case of the Navy Cross, that doesn't. Oh, that yeah. Kind of yeah, stuff. you got uh, Gold Star, so it says, uh, For meritorious achievement in aerial flight, a pilot of bomber in Squadron 18, U.S. Trip during the action against Japanese fleet, November 25, participating in a mi mission. Against enemy shipping in the face of intense anti aircraft fire, Lieutenant Junior Grade Chevelle skillfully and daringly pressed home his attack to contribute to the total destruction of three en enemy mine layers and one escort. Uh, so, you know, you get these, these write ups. There's a documentation for, mm -hmm. for each one. Um, but you'd come back and Oh, here we go. What's this one for? The Navy Cross was for hitting uh, uh, on the the battleship, and the first DFC was uh, what was this one for? After flying over 50 miles under conditions of zero visibility. Chevelle pressed home a vigorous dive bombing attack in the face of anti intense anti aircraft fire and destroyed a smash, and in spite of a smashed elevator score, damaging hits on a naval dry dock. And then uh, the second one was uh, diving through heavy. Well, this is the one where I made a glide bombing attack on the enemy. Uh, 
battleship and su succeeded in scoring a near miss. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a classic. You got a, you got a medal for hitting a near miss. And uh, a near miss can be uh, can, can it damp could, a rudder. Yeah, know. it could have. It could have. I don't know. Uh, this is uh, this is for our, uh, this is the air medal. Uh, total destruction of three enemy mine layers and one escort uh, vessel. So we go down a strafe a lot of these things. Now we, I, actually, this is what I was going to ask you about some of the, the, the methodology here, and then we started talking about how a mission would begin. But like, for instance, when you're diving, do you also shoot from the forward no, gun? No, 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 no. When you're diving, you got to, uh, well, the first thing, you know, you, you're starting uh, as high as you can get about 20,000. I know when we're on this fleet, jet so fleet. So you're on oxygen at that point? Oh, uh, yeah. And... Uh, you roll over, you got to get your tabs, uh, you set, you, they were vertical, we were vertical, you know, we were almost the straight. The idea was to use the speed straight, of the airplane. Straight down. And then an then armored bomb, the idea, it would, it would, if you can get the two of those combined, and when it hit the top of the ship, the, that bomb can penetrate and keep going right Well, they're armor-piercing bombs to start with, but when you came down, you had to, uh, you had to make sure your, your plane was trim. It couldn't be sliding if you were, uh, you weren't going straight and you were uh, sliding a little bit. Well, when you released the bomb, the bomb would slide with it. See, mm -hmm. it would go, it would go this way. So you couldn't be in a skid. You had to be, you had to have your a, a, a needle ball and airspeed. That ball had to be right in, in so the you, middle. So you've actually got a. Uh, a Instru you got to look at look at your instruments. You look at your instruments, and you, we had artificial horizons. And so that would give you a, 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 a reading on your on your wings, but the the needle ball and airspeed they they were the ones that would tell you whether you were skidding. If the ball stayed right square, and so you had to tab up everything, and and when you came down and you had, and it had to be for quite a while, you, you you couldn't just make these adjustments at the last minute, and then. The other part of the problem was uh, if there was a wind or uh, the ship was in a turn or it was going straight ahead, you had to figure that out so that once, you know, if the ship's going like this and you, you, you bomb, you're up here at you know, about 1,500 feet, you release the bomb, well then the ship's going to go here and the bomb's going to go here. So you had to lead it. It's just like shooting, uh, mm -hmm. shooting a gun. Right. Shooting ducks or shooting quail or something like that. So you, like you that. started about twelve, thirteen, you said. Oh, twenty thousand. Twenty thousand feet. Yeah. And you'd be pulling out and dropping a bomb about fifteen hundred. Uh, fifteen hundred was the uh, a safe pullout uh, because uh, although I, I would say most of the guys went below that, they were they were tent on there. They, they'd go to a thousand feet. But if you got below a thousand feet, you could get hit by the concussion of the bomb. Right. You 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 you. you so once once you hit, once you you dropped, then you, you you had to pull out. And we didn't have G suits then. Uh, you just suck in your gut because the G's would would yeah. would take take all the blood from your head down. And so you you'd pull up like this, and you had to be careful when you pulled up. Because some if you blacked out, and, and sometimes we did, the guys did. You just couldn't see anything. Well, when that happened, you just had to stay steady, wh whatever you were doing. You couldn't, don't fool around with any any of the controls, uh, or pull the stick back or anything. Just, you just got to wait for the blood to come back. But as soon as you pull out of the dive, and and you knew you were uh, you're in one piece, well, then you started jinking. They call this going up and down, erratic flying up and down and down because that would to keep the uh, enemy aircraft from getting a, a lead on you. Mm -hmm. And remember, they didn't have the, uh, the sophisticated uh, gunnery that they have today. So they, they was all, it was still basic leading, just like you're leading. Right. Hosing. Yeah, yeah. So you're at 13,000 feet. You 20. Drop, drop your, oh, 20,000 feet, sorry. You drop your flaps, great. I remember reading somewhere, you know, great big, they said, uh, great big holes in the flaps and the things that drop. Oh yeah, you had dive flaps. Dive flaps. Oh sure. Sure. Right. Yeah, and then, then the engine would obviously race as you're as you're going down. Like well, you could no, you could throttle back because you did. You you wouldn't have any. Uh, but the thing must be making a hell of a racket as you're going straight down. Not really. 
No, just the air. You have you had your canopy open. They always insisted you, uh, you, in case you got hit, you could get out. You could parachute. And if you had a closed canopy, because uh, uh, one time when I was on uh, on patrol, uh, well, I saw a fighter pilot. One of our fighter pilots uh, uh, had to make a water landing, and he couldn't get his canopy open. And I circled and circled, circled, and called for help from a surface vessel. And the poor guy drowned. The plane went down. And he couldn't get. He couldn't get out of there. So, you always kept your canopy open in case you had to. No injection. No no seat right. injections. Then it was parachutes. See, and right. so that's the reason for it. And you had goggles on, of course, and uh, but then so after you. How fast is the airplane actually going if you're going straight down like that? Miles per hour? Oh golly, I don't know. Uh, I don't. I, yeah, that's a good question. I've never <laughs> seen that. Uh, I don't know what the velocity would be, would have been. Because flat and level, that that's probably 150 mile an hour. Oh no, no, we used to cruise about 220. That was oh, really? that was one reason why it was uh, a much better airplane than the SBD. It had a lot a lot faster airplane. So if you're doing 220 flat, I mean, you, you must have been going. Well, you, you know, when you go, you just peel off like this, and down you come. Right. So you don't you don't have the, the engine running. The engines you got right. got it pulled back, and so you just come down and pull out. And then and then they they'd always have a rendezvous point at a certain uh, location. Uh, this is where you away from the mm -hmm. from the uh, the ships you were attacking, and then they rendezvous the squadron and come back to the ship. Hmm. Um, well, this is another one. Same thing. My hitting hit a bunch of mine layers and so forth. Uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, strafing too, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, the twenty millimeters, uh, especially on uh, if you went into a harbor. And you had like these mine layers or something like that. Uh, uh, you just hit them with, uh, with 20 millimeters, and boy, they'd blow them up. They they were deadly. Mm -hmm. they were, that was is that a, is that a bullet or is that a cannon? 20 mil 20 millimeter gun. Gun. So that yeah, it's instead of instead of having machine guns. Right. Uh, the SPD had 50 caliber machine guns mounted in the wings. See. Mm -hmm. The SP-2C had two 20 millimeter. So two these, these are rounds that actually explode upon impact. Well, yeah, they were just a bigger bullet. That's right. all. Yeah. Um, so were you? you um, I guess on board ship you were able to stay in touch with your family all through the uh, your your time on board. Well, you had fleet post office, and uh, Marge used to <laughs> make me brownies, <coughs> and she'd mail those out, and maybe. Two or three months later, they'd come aboard ship. You know. Did you guys get married before the war or after? After. Yeah. after. Right. No, no. See, we married uh, after the war. Um, but you're able to stay in touch that way through uh, right through the whole thing by, by mail. Yeah. How yeah. often did you get, receive mail? Oh, it just depends. The, the mail would come aboard uh, the uh, when you you have the uh, Oilers would come uh, come alongside. To refuel the carrier, and that's when you would get your mail right. and a new supply of ice cream. So you knew he was right in the thick of it. And no, she didn't know because uh, anything you wrote at that time was all censored. Right. So you'd, you'd, you'd write whatever you want, and uh, we had a, uh, an office officer aboard, uh, and they'd cut out the little sections mm -hmm. that had any reference to it. And Dick Duckett was pretty good at that. He we got some of the letters. Uh, Marge just showed me some of the letters I wrote her, and you could hardly tell what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, like even stateside, the, some of these big battles, like Leyte Gulf and stuff, you wouldn't have heard about this until months later or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. Well, you got the, you know, on the newspaper, or, uh, radio, whatever they wanted to give you at local local right. level, but you weren't permitted to say anything about any of these uh, things. Right. See, the ship eventually. Uh, uh, we were off of supporting a MacArthur in his landing at uh, Leyte, and the ship got hit by kamikazes. And I had just left the flight deck uh, 
for a strike <coughs> and uh, the ship got hit and when we came back from the strike uh, we couldn't land there uh, the ship was burning and they were trying to save the ship and uh, so uh, they routed us to Tacloban which was Leyte where MacArthur had just landed there but there was an airstrip and so we, we came in uh, our, our division came in and landed and taxied the planes in and they had, they had army airplanes there too and ours and uh, that was curious at that time a um, uh, little side side note but uh, when I went to high school uh, there was a fellow who was a movie star and a, a, a very good correspondent, Lee Van Atta. And he was attached to MacArthur staff and wrote the, uh, and did all the covering for uh, international news service during the war. Uh, he was quite, quite a good writer. Uh, in fact, he wrote a book called No Peace in These Skies on a three-day mission and he took three days off in uh, in Australia and wrote the book. But anyway, Lee was with MacArthur and he had somehow or another got the uh, composition of the flights that were coming in from the Navy, the personnel. He probably got it from MacArthur the, or they radioed in. These guys are going to land. And he recognized my name and I hadn't, I hadn't seen him for quite a while. And by golly, he met us. When we yeah. landed there, he came over and uh, huh. we we no sooner landed and they had a, a Japanese alert uh, aircraft alert so we all went for the dugouts you know and and that's where I met uh, Lee and uh, he wrote a little piece about me on the hometown paper oh, that's great but uh, uh, it was coincidental that we met him. And I don't know. I lost track of Lee. He came back, went back into the movies as a director and so forth. But he's quite a guy. Hmm. Uh, so was your squadron then also in truck? No. Is not part of that? No. It came a no. little later? No, okay. no, no. Or the, what, what do they call it on the Marianas Turkey shoot? No, we weren't in on the Marianas Turkey shoot. But you were in on Okinawa? Nope. No? No, we, we got hit in... Um, December of 44 and they didn't know what to do with us because uh, you couldn't land we were stuck on stuck with MacArthur and uh, what what MacArthur wanted to do was to commandeer us to fly in his air corps <laughs> and uh, uh, Admiral Halsey wasn't about to do that he wasn't about to turn turn Navy Navy planes over to to the army right. so we stayed there a day or so and then it was uh, decided that we would fly fly our planes back to Ulithi as an overly over water flight of uh, I don't know 300 350 miles and Ulithi was a, an atoll mm -hmm. and it was a, a staging center where the ships uh, Oh, it was huge, huge. Have you ever heard about Ulithi? Yeah. Yeah, it was a huge atoll, and they could take the whole the whole U.S. Navy in there for Anchorage if it wanted to. Mm -hmm. Task Force 38, fact is, we were in there. We went in, We were in there one time when they had a uh, huge typhoon, and they ordered us out, ordered the ships out of the atoll, out to the high seas to, to ride out the storm. I but read about that. They actually lost a couple small ships in that. All storm? three destroyers, yeah. And, uh, they, they, uh, the, 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 uh, the fury of the sea is, uh, is tremendous. And this huge carrier, I saw these I beams on the, up in the forecastle, just bent. You know, they're like a big steel girders. Great big son of a gun. And they're just bent. I saw pictures uh, of the, uh, the Hornet after that same storm yeah. and on board and uh, you see whole bits of it all torn up in fact part of the flight deck got torn up yeah here it is uh, this is on November 25 our ship hit twice by kamikaze uh, Doc Fish our chief uh, Doc Fish was our flight surgeon 
he was killed. Chief Woods, he was our uh, head of our maintenance, was killed. 69 dead, 30 wounded. Extremely bad fire. Captain Bolger decorated for saving the ship. Uh, we landed on Leyte, Tacloban, remained through the 26th. That's, we, that's, uh, this is on the 25th, the 26th. On the 27th, we flew 625 miles from Leyte to, to Peleliu, then flew 325 miles from Peleliu to Ulithi. And uh, so we, we went, we were on the, uh, on, on the atoll. We didn't go aboard ship, but eventually they got the ship fixed up. And on the 30th, uh, our fighter squadron was transferred to the Hancock, and I had a note here, bad break. Hmm. They needed fighters, but... Now, was the Hancock also a... Um, it was a, it was a, a Essex, Essex carrier, Essex type carrier. So on the 30th, uh, well, they relented and um, decided that the, uh, the fighter squadron, the whole squadron, and all the ship's personnel were going to go back to states. Uh, on board the same ship? On board the ship. So, the, so the, at that so point, the Intrepid could take uh, airplanes back aboard? No, no. Okay. No, we left them there. We left them on uh, there. No, no, we just went aboard. The ship was all battered up. And so we went from there, cruised back to Pearl, and then got into uh, the Alameda Christmas of 44. Oh, that must have been nice, though. I mean, you know, oh, obviously yeah. the war's still going on, but the oh, back yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you able to see your family and everything? Were you guys able to see each other? Oh, Marge was in the east. She was. I didn't see her for well, it was quite a while. A couple of months later, you came out west. Uh, no, well, sure, we got we got liberty, got Good. to go home. Good. Oh, sure. Well, you were one of the lucky ones because you were reasonably close to. Yeah. Home. Oh, sure, sure. Went home and. and so we had a lot of celebrations. <laughs> did you bring any, I mean, you must have had guys in your squadron that were from Georgia or something. Did you bring, bring anybody home with you? or? Did oh, you no, no, no. Everyone went for their own family. No. So no. how long was your liberty at that point? How, how, how much did uh, you I think it was a month. And then we, we reorganized. Uh, let's see, I lose my other book. We, February 45. Uh, it was about a month, yeah, because in uh, February 45, I went into fighter bombers. That was uh, VBF-18. Flew, uh, we flew F-6Fs, and our, we were stationed in Astoria, Oregon. And then we were the first squadron to get the F-8F. Uh, and they transferred us to uh, San Diego. That's the Bearcat? The Bearcat, and that was... Oh boy, what an airplane that was! That the one could. Start off, they had Hellcats, and then no, they had. Well, the uh, the uh, the Bearcat, the F eight F, was faster than the P fifty one. We used to go to Los Angeles, and it's the only plane the Navy had at that time that could beat a P fifty one. Wow! Put on a water injection, and then you could leave them in the dust. It really? was a wonderful airplane. It had an unusual thing. It had a F-8F had uh, panels on the wingtips, so if you got too many G's, they would automatically snap off uh, if you got, if you pulled too many G's. Mm -hmm. uh, but it it was it was fun to fly. The Navy planes, the wings had to come up. They always had radial engines, right? Mm -hmm. Because they had they were shorter, yeah. and that way they could get locked up on a ship. They're, on a, on, a, on board an aircraft carrier, there's always an issue with space, and so you want to get as many airplanes as possible in there. So they were the Navy airplanes were unique that way. They were they had to always have radial engines, folding wings, all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the uh, now we then well then we we stayed in the um, stayed in the squadron and then um, in San Diego and then they uh, said the uh, they were going to uh, go to New Orleans for Navy Day. At first, at first, no, at first we were going to go back to sea again, and uh, none of us wanted to do that. We thought we'd had enough of the sea, so <laughs> they put us aboard the, uh, I know I, know I w took my, went with Bob Clancy, and we went out to shoot 
dove out in out in El Centro and uh, got word out there to report immediately to to your ship to the squadron so we came back to the squadron and they said we're going to go aboard the Ranger and uh, we're headed for New Orleans well we didn't know where we were headed for but it was a big disappointment as soon as we got aboard ship and got out to sea they said we were headed for going through the canal and so we went we uh, so what time uh, when was this uh, Navy Day 45 uh, we docked at the foot of Canal Street in New Orleans and so what that, huh? is, that, is that like the war still going on at this point right no the war's over no the war was was over with then okay so uh, so after you got back to San Francisco with on board ship when a ship was damaged you basically went through your different training and everything else and your combat was over your war combat yeah, anyway, yeah was the over. war combat was okay, good yeah, yeah. So, uh, where were you when you found out about the end of the war? I don't remember. I don't remember when, when, when the war was... Do you remember where you were when you learned that the war was over? Well, it was during the summer. Huh? It was during the summer. Summer. Because I had come out here. The BJ Day. BJ, well, yeah. Actually, actually let's, let's back up. Do you remember hearing that FDR had died? Uh, yeah. You were stateside then, because that was in April of yeah. right? Yeah, 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 I remember that. Mm -hmm. Right, and then, wa then the war in Europe was over right after that. Yeah, right, right, right. right. So, so you, that oh, must have been quite a party. At, at that point in time, my only interest was getting out of the Navy, because they put a lot of pressure on us guys to, to stay in. Uh, well, on that crews on the Ranger. I know our ACI officer, Air Combat Intelligence officer, and the skipper, and they all, they all said, Jesus, it's a good life art, stay in, stay in, stay in, this, that, said, no way. I said, I want to go home. Uh, uh, every, we had moved, it seemed like every three months we had moved as long as I've been in the Navy, and uh, so uh, most of us felt that way, and uh, and you're still together as a squadron. Yeah, as soon as yeah, we got a, uh, we received our decorations to get out. We were uh, in New Orleans, and I had a picture in here of uh, um, all of us on board the Ranger. Here's a these these the fellows that we received. Yeah. That was written up in New Orleans, and this was the athletic officer. He was a big gambler, and uh, Bosberg uh, ran the uh, pinball machines in New Orleans, and he met us, and boy, what a time he showed us, I'll tell <laughs> you. He knew his way around. He, he'd already got out. He'd had the points to get out. Right. So. So this is October of 45. Yeah. Right. And so we, that's on board the Ranger, the... They gave us our decoration. As soon as we got the points, we, we, we went for it. Now, so the, uh, the Intrepid, of course, is tied up in New York. When they, when, they, when they dedicated that whole museum and everything else, did they have all you guys come out? Did they oh, no, come out? no, no. I've never. Uh, we were supposed to go back there, and what was it? Well, for some reason or another. Your mother died. Yeah, when in 88, we had a squadron reunion that was going to go down to, to see the Intrepid. No, I've never seen it. I've often wanted to. It's a, it's the foot of Forty uh, Second Street. Right, right on the Hudson River. Right on the Hudson River. Yeah, yeah. I'd want to go back and see the ship again, but no, we've we've never got back to it. Hmm. Uh, I'd like to, but time's running out. Huh. Um, no, I came back and after the war and um, uh, immediately went back to school, got and then got married. So you were married when? April 46. April 46, okay. Yeah, and had to, at that time you couldn't find anything to get married in, so I took my blues and had all the stripes and everything moved, all the, the gold braid and all that stuff taken off, and that's I got married. <laughs> so you, uh, you, you finished the Navy as a JG? Yeah, right. and then I stayed in, uh, uh, I flew in the reserve. Um, they flew out of Oakland and then uh, Livermore and, and then Oakland. And I stayed in there until 50, yeah. Well, weren't you a lieutenant before you got out? Yeah, I got, yeah, I got promoted, I got promoted to a lieutenant somewhere along the line. I mustered out as a, as a lieutenant. 
uh, but <laughs> we'd go over there as a weekend warrior and, and fly and see the last time was uh, June 4, 1950. 1950. And yeah. what were you we flying at the end there? F6F. We were in fighters. Uh, right. uh, well, I got so, uh, Mark, it got, I had a sedentary job. I was, uh, I was working for Kraft Foods. I had a good job. And we were trying to uh, uh, adopt a child, which we finally did. And uh, Dan Baker, this fellow here, is the one that got us. He got both of our children. Oh, really? He's an attorney in, uh, in Oakland. And, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, I'd come home after spending a weekend over there flying, and <coughs> and Don Watts, who'd been the, um, the the fighter pilot I mentioned, uh, he was our skipper, <coughs> and he had a outdoor job, and he worked in the field. He was in great shape, but geez, most of us were, were desk jockeys and flabby, and and he'd take us up and ring us out, you know, and, and mm -hmm. gunnery runs and, and all that stuff. I'd come home with headaches and, geez, I'd just come home and collapse. <laughs> and I said, boy, this can't go on for, forever because Watts was a wild man. And, uh... Plus, it's still dangerous. I mean, it's, you know, even, even though it's not combat, I mean... Oh, yeah, well, it was, I'd love to fly, but, uh, uh we didn't have G-shoots. G you know, later on, they got G-suits. All right. That would put pressure. They would put pressure on your legs and hold the hold the blood up. But if you made a an overhead gunnery run or any of these things, and then you pulled out, it it just sucked on you. All right. And uh, so I got out of the reserve. Were you happy when he stopped flying? I never worried too much about when he flew. Mm -hmm. um, I worried when he was in combat. Did a lot of praying. Mm -hmm. Uh. You're welcome to look at any of these pictures you want to. I don't know uh, what, what? what. What I was going to ask you. I mean, if, if this is great, if we could take this with us. Sure, you have it. Okay. Um, this guy wrote a hell of a story. Right. Uh, foresight. Uh, oh, he's a wild man. Um, but it, it's an interesting story. It's an interesting story. Uh, a lot of those things in there. Uh, I mean, a couple of us guys read the book and said, well, "Geez, where 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 do you get this stuff from?" <laughs> <laughs> do you have any uh, pictures of actual combat? I mean, obviously uh, nobody brings a camera with them on board. On the no, you weren't allowed to have anything. I got dive bombing or bombs on this, and uh, I don't know uh, uh, any. Uh, I was lucky to get that picture of the of the crash. Uh, well, they had the first reunion. Uh, some of the ones that had taken pictures brought them. Mm -hmm. But that, that was on, who was the fellow at the time? Shipman. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a, there's just the bomb drop in the Philippines. Uh, but some of these guys actually took pictures from. Well, yes, and didn't he, fo he made well, them back some way? The way he got the pictures was to become uh, Ralph Beadle was a fighter pilot and he was the official uh, photographer. He'd go out on these runs to uh, uh, camera runs, picture runs in advance of strikes to get the lay of the land and uh, uh, Ralph took a couple of pictures. I don't know who to, this was, this came from the ship's company. Someone, someone took that shot uh, and gave it to me. But say I got pictures in here. I got guys in the ready room. Uh, but actual well, keep hit, hit and hit. This may actually be a good good time to shut this off, and we can talk about the pictures. Um, okay. Is there anything because this is going to be there forever? This is part of the national. Archive. Oh, that's all right. Okay. Anything? Is there anything you want to add at this point? No, no, that's fine. I, uh, I, I, I would say this. I, uh, I'm a firm believer in military service. I think every young man. Uh, today should spend uh, uh, a tour of duty in the military. I think the military teaches you uh, uh, respect for your fellow man and I think it teaches you discipline and cleanliness and uh, it, it's a darn good experience. It, it gives you an entirely different outlook on life that you don't get if you're just a civilian. 
I think that if we had uh, had a it was required that everybody every young guy spend uh, a year or two years in the military whatever uh, it would broaden his horizon and it would give him a great deal of maturity mm -hmm. uh, that would be be my feeling uh, I, I, and a lot of them leads to uh, today would lead to good occupations uh, geez the technology is just paramount in the Europe in the military today they need uh, they'll, they'll teach you mm -hmm. uh, teach you a trade they teach you uh, give you a lot of technical did you finish college on the GI Bill oh yeah you did oh, yeah. we lived on twenty dollars a month for a long time <laughs> see here's my friend Dan he's a he's the one that got and they give him the Navy Cross. Uh, this is Preston? No. no, this is Dan Baker. Oh, Dan Baker, okay. Yeah, there's a picture of Ben Preston in here. I wish they they, sh they should have written a book about Ben because, geez, he was a he was a he was a great man. Yeah. Right. Of course, it happened to be right there because I was his wingman. Right. <laughs> there you go. That's him. Very good. So this is uh, probably can't. This is Helldivers yeah. by John Forsyth, and uh, I recommend reading. Yeah, it's it's an interesting story, uh, but as I say, it's uh, one that he wanted to do, and right. he he's got a lot of wild tales in there. That some of us don't recognize, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll shut this off now. Okay.